You know, when uh, I started first seeing uh, oral facial pain patients more than 25 years ago, there was a sense of, you know, you were a quack, you know? And so other clinicians would say, what are you talking about? You know, there's not this and what have you. Um, I don't, fortunately, I don't see that anymore. I still see reticence from some of our dental colleagues that, mm, you know, maybe this isn't really the case. Although I see a lot more patients that get sent to me uh, that are kind of end of the line. You know, they get, they've gone from a general dentist to an endodontist to an oral surgeon. None of those people can figure it out. So they find their way to me. And so, and so, but I think that adds credibility to our field as well. Um, the other thing that I think adds credibility is the fact that insurance carriers recognize it as well. So patients come in, it's like, well, how can this be real if an insurance carrier doesn't recognize this as legitimate treatment? If they don't recognize these diagnosis, diagnostic codes and aren't willing to pay for it, it can't be real. You must be, you must be, you know, selling snake oil. So I think for a lot of those reasons, those types of uncertainties go away. So we can focus on what is the patient's chief complaint? What's the biology behind it? And how do we get to a better outcome for them? I think one of the problems with the failure to recognize oral facial pain as a special discipline was that many people didn't believe oral facial pain was a problem. And so you could, uh, it was difficult to uh, present evidence-based information and have it be believed. So going back from other clinicians in dentistry, clinicians in medicine, um, insurance carriers that control reimbursement, all of that affected access to care. So I think immediately the, the floodgates will open, or at least they'll start to. Uh, I think secondarily, another thing that is critical from this is that now we can train other clinicians, current clinicians, about evidence-based oral facial pain. And we can now train the next generations of clinicians in oral facial pain as well without having to keep defending ourselves. So that level of credibility is critical. So now we can focus on, on the betterment of patient care research methods, which uh, the, again, the uh, evidence base is still, uh, still historically weak, in part because it's been blocked. This field has been blocked. And I think now the recognition of it, I think will help a lot. In many ways, I see oral facial pain, um, um, the model being medicine. I believe, um, having a non-surgical um, uh, discipline to address um, oral facial pain issues was important just like in medicine, like neurologists coexist and collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons. Well, I believe oral facial pain specialists will still collaborate with oral surgeons, but we see that most of the care for oral, for oral facial pain is not surgically based. And so I think this now gives credibility to that. And so. You know, I thank people like Dr. Clark and all the other people who stayed with us all along, um, who continue to believe in this field, even though um, uh, there was a lot of pushback. And so, you know, thank you very much for leading the way. And I think this is a great day for our patients.